You have to have data to run your model. So what does it take to run this? We'll, we'll go through these um, relatively quickly or in a little bit more detail. We need some land cover, some topography, some precip values, soils, pollutant bowl coefficients, and rainfall erosivity numbers. Those, there are, within the U.S. at least, kind of national data sets that you can get values from. The pollutant coefficients, we just use some that are pretty consistent with P-load out um, basic. So, and then locally, if you want to compare, it, it allows you, or the old version did, but you actually hit this in the current release, um, you can compare against something like a TMDL, and you can add whatever other pollutants you want. An important thing is all of these things, like any other model, the better numbers you put in into it, the better the results come out. Okay? So these, these um, especially pollutant coefficients and stuff, they're pretty general. So they're, all, and they're an okay starting spot. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the details here. The topography um, is going to define our stream networks. And, you know, at the 30 meter layer, is our 30 meter resolution is generally good enough for us. The reason is because, as we heard, the resolution does impact the processing speed and file size and land cover, which is what we use. You have to have a, a raster land cover. You can convert a shape file or something into a raster. But the ones that we generally use are either our coastal change analysis program that the center puts out which is kind of the coastal component of the um, national <coughs> M MRLC, the medium resolution land cover product so that, that you would get from USGS, 30 meter dynamic mapper classified land cover. So the reason we go with 30 meters on a DEM, say, you know, don't really go higher than that unless you get a land cover higher than that. Because it will change um, the DEM, if, if you went, say, to a 10 meter DEM, your streams would probably go to the same places. They would wiggle with a higher resolution, right? But the land cover is so dominant in the processes you're simulating that it doesn't really make sense to operate at a DEM that's outside this market. All right, but you can, you can substitute any old land cover you've got in here. <coughs> It does take soils data. There's a couple of things in here. It's, we need to know the soils, um, hydrologic soils group, and the K factor for the Russell equation, which is an erodibility factor. Um, we're pretty fond of the Sergo data that, that you can get from NRCS. All right, but that's one of the points where there's some challenges and things that, that are harder to do and not window than they used to do that if we can figure out how to do it. Um, I don't know if you can, how well you see that. But for every land cover that we have, you'll see you've got to have a curve number for each soil group, how much water comes off, and a cover factor, which is that K factor um, for our classified land cover. All right, precipitation. This is, is one of our big inputs going in. This can be as hard or as easy to do as you want to make it. We were out in this part of Hawaii where I don't, I don't know if you can, if that's clear, it's 153 inches of rain is their annual average. And again, seven rainy days, right? So, man, when it rains up there in the mountains, it rains big time. But down here, it's only like 10 inches of the coast. Right? This is, this is Oahu, big mountain range here. Okay, in this place, we needed good spatially resolved precipitation data, right? Because it makes a big difference what the land cover is in the mountains. Coastal South Carolina, where we are on the app, our annual average over the, over the county I live in, it's, it might only vary by like one inch of rain. And right? when it rains there, and it rains a lot, but it rains kind of everywhere. So that's one of the things that, that you can, um, you can make as hard as easy as you can. We like the, for the, on the national basis, Oregon State has the PRISM data, very nice spreaded rainfall information if you need that. Um, or here we work with local climatologists, state climatologists who had 43 years worth of data from a bunch of different states 
or, or locations that just did a regression on rainfall versus elevation, um, we're able to come up with some reasonable solution. All right, pollutants. Here's our land cover, Di or our different land covers, each of which, for a particular pollutant, has, again, I call it the magic number. This is the concentration that comes off of that land, no matter how much water it's coming off. Right? This is the concentration of that pollutant that that water will contain. That's the idea behind an event mean concentration. So it's ignoring that whole time dependency of the first flush and of a runoff from a storm. It doesn't care how long ago the previous storm was. It's one of the reasons why it's good to do this on an annual basis. It makes a little more sense to me. Um, what do you get out of it? Let's just go through this. Runoff. So we get a nice stream network that shows you the volume of runoff. Um, and we did this part, we, we validated kind of right off the bat for a number of different smaller watersheds in, out in Hawaii where they had good rainfall data, and it, it does pretty good. There, the, um, the black line is the one-to-one -one versus calculated versus um, versus predicted runoff. <coughs> erosion. So this is the accumulated erosion, because I ran these, these particular run as an annual event. What our guys doing the corals wanted to see was for these points right down here, that's the annual sediment load that's entering the marine environment. Same thing with nitrogen, annual total nitrogen coming in. Um, and the other thing though that we do is if you actually put, put out a pollutant in kind of three different ways. We accumulate it, so you can see the total load. We do this, which is accumulated nitrogen divided by accumulated water, which is a concentration <laughs> And so it's kind of a proxy for what's the average concentration that an area is exposed to. So you can understand that in terms of impacts to the, to the biota or the, what's, what's living there. And then another one we do where we don't do any accumulation, that identifies the source areas. Looks very much like this. So if you want to do some restoration, then this gives you an idea of where you would really want to go. And then the other thing that this does, that I neglected to put a screen in, is it's got a interface to easily let you change, say now I want to change this line cover to a different land cover, what's, what's the difference in my results? Okay, and that's where you get the comparison portion of. All right, who else is using this tool? Um, actually, quite, so quite a bit of people, but I'm just going to show two examples and I'll give you a website where you can go and see some other kind of case studies. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm barely going to talk about this, but um, the, uh, so the Army Corps actually did a, or one of their contractors out uh, in a spot from Hawaii, one of the things they wanted to know, this is on the big island of Hawaii, was what are the sediment, what's the sediment flow coming from individual storms and episodic events. And so they used this to kind of characterize their 10-year events, their 20-year events, and for a watershed they were worried about developing to get an idea of the sediment loads that would be coming off under a variety of different um, environments. Because the advantage here, even though it has all those other, you know, it's got some caveats like any model, right? You want to use it dependent. I right? think it's, it's all consistent. So if you vary one thing, it's a quick, easy way to look at what's the relative impact of the other. <coughs> Another one, Kingston Lake Watershed Association, which is kind of, um, the Conway, which is outside of Myrtle Beach, if that helps. Um, South Carolina, we're wanting to help guide development within their watershed in a sustainable manner. So they had a variety of different growth scenarios with uncertainty bounds on them. And so they looked at their total nitrogen through these different land cover changes through time and looked at when they would be exceeding some of their TMDL numbers and stuff for this. So again, it's not used to predict exact numbers, but to look at consistent, a consistent way of examining trends as things move forward was pretty clever. I like that one. All right, you can find this, get involved at the CodePlex site, inspect.codeplex.com. Of course, you know about mapwindows.org, you wouldn't be here. If you want to look at the 
Esri version. The Esri version will work on, on all of the nines, on three, nine, three. We have no, we're not moving it to ten. Right? That's, so, so, uh, grab three, the nine, three version if you want while you're there. And also, if you go to this side, um, this side doesn't link to the open source version yet. Um, because it's, it's not exactly out. Um, you can find some of these use cases. So, so that's a worthwhile one. We also have a list server. Um, it's, it's a bit of a ghost plan right now, or ghost town, so don't be too worried that we're going to date your email box. But if you want to follow stuff, we'd have, love to have you sign up on that. Um, I've taken any questions. My contact information is here. Shan was unable to make it here at the last minute, but Matt Pendleton is back in the back over there. We'll be doing a workshop tomorrow in the hydrology section. So we'll miss the Tau Dem discussion, which is too bad because I'm, I'm going to have to talk with you guys about it because I, I have some Tau Dem things on my wish list. But, um, you have any questions?